Now we come to the final talk uh, of this day, and it's my great pleasure to invite Dr. Campbell uh, to the stage. I have already introduced him as being very active on social media, and he is, besides this, a cardiologist and electrophysiologist. He comes from North Carolina, United States, and he is the CEO of a remote monitoring company. So he's very well familiar with all the aspects of modern electrophysiology and device and data management. And we have already discussed in the last session the question how to handle, how to manage these data. So it's time for his stage. Welcome. What I want to talk to you about today is how we can improve outcomes in our patients, which is why we're all here. We want our patients to do well and do better by using big data, artificial intelligence, and remote monitoring. Data is huge. There's more than 500 petabytes of data in the healthcare realm right now. Just with Kaiser Permanente, one of the managed care organizations in California, there are over, I think it's almost 50 petabytes of data just in their electronic health record. When I talk about data, I talk about Initially, the three Vs. I'm going to argue today we need to talk about five Vs. But the three Vs are velocity, meaning that real-time biometric data is flowing very, very quickly. Right now, I'm wearing an Alive Carcardia band and is tracking my real-time EKG. And I'm used to being on television, so my heart rate's about 80 right now. Sometimes it gets lower. But variety. We have data coming from all kinds of angles, from all kinds of devices. We got Cardio MEMS, we've got Alive Core, we've got other patches, we've got devices, uh, we've got loop recorders. Data's coming from everywhere. And then the volume, the data never stops. It's 24 7, it's constant, it's enormous. And I just showed you just within the US system, there's 500 petabytes of data. I would argue that these are expanding very, very quickly on all three fronts the velocity, the variety, all of this data is expanding. But in healthcare, we care about a couple of other things, not just the volume of data. We wanna make sure that data is viable. So we need to figure out if we're looking at a data point and we wanna use it in a predictive model to predict disease or to predict outcome or to predict events, we've gotta quickly and cost effectively test and confirm that this variable is actually relevant before instituting any type of decision-making or artificial intelligence algorithm for that data. Then I would say we also need value, V, the fifth V. We got to create a model that answers questions that are important. How do we figure out the best way to do his bundle pacing? How do we figure out the best technique? Should it be done in this patient versus that patient? By the way, the American College of Cardiology last night, my good colleague and friend, Prash Sanders, had a Twitter chat all on uh, his bundle patient. It was quite interesting the variable uh, amount of data that folks are having and everyone agreed just like we did I think today that we need randomized controlled trials. Big data is actually kind of a dichotomy because you've got data coming from everywhere. It's all these big population studies, you've got predictive analytics, but ultimately we're talking about using big data to personalize care and personalize therapies. Imagine a world where you go into your doctor's office, you show them your, your, your iPhone, and they, they look at a particular scan on the iPhone, it has your DNA there, it, it has your code, and it says that if you come in with a mycoplasma pneumonia, you're gonna respond best to azithromycin versus another treatment versus another treatment. So we ultimately, when I talk about big data, I'm talking about personalized medicine for you, individualizing care for you getting you the right type of his bundle patient, getting you the right type of CRT, performing the right type of ablation, whatever that may be. But personalized medicine is really about innovating, an innovation that enables real-time diagnosis. No longer is it okay for us as diagnosticians and cardiologists, electrophysiologists to, to make an intervention and then wait and see how things go and see the patient in three months. We want real-time feedback, and that's a game changer in my mind. And using data to determine the course of the disease can really change the way we treat disease. In the US, we have been focused far too long on treatment. We need to be fo focused on prevention. I tell my colleagues my goal is to put myself and every other cardiologist in the world out of business because we find a better way to prevent disease. That's not an attainable goal, but it's the concept that I like. 
One of my mentors in the digital space is Eric Topol, probably one of the most famous cardiologists in the United States. And in 2012, he wrote a book called The Creative Disruption of Medicine. And it really started the way we're starting to think or we're thinking now about using big data. And one of the things he says, and I really believe it to be true, is there's a new model of medicine and it's induced by the digital era. Whether you're on Twitter or Facebook or you're using an electronic health record or I'm doing my EKG from my watch or from my uh, mobile device, it doesn't matter, but it's changed the way information is flowing. No longer is information flowing, I'm gonna talk to one person and they're gonna talk to the next. I'm gonna tweet out to 22,000 followers and they're gonna tweet out to their followers and then everybody who wasn't fortunate enough to be in this room for this conference and these wonderful speakers we've had today there's people in Japan that may be able to hear it. There's my colleagues in Manila who may be able to hear it. I have colleagues at Stanford, Mintu, and, and my buddies there. They could see what's going on here. Just like that Twitter chat, I stayed up last night till 1 a.m. because it, was, it started at 5 or 6 Eastern time. So I stayed up for that Twitter chat on his bundle pacing. And now, if you want to, you could, hit, you could go into Twitter and search hashtag um, don't diss the hiss, and you'd see that Twitter chat. Eric also said, and this is what I, my, my mission is to get doctors to change. Eric said the digital world has been in a separate orbit, in a cocoon away from the doctors. Doctors over here, digital world over here. We've got to take those boundaries down. The problem is all of us as physicians and healthcare providers and administrators and business people, it takes us forever to change. Our rate of change in medicine is absolutely unacceptable. I think we're really lucky in EP because I think EP, we're the mad scientists of medicine. We love new toys, new tools, new ways to do things. We love data. We love to change the way people think. So I think we're ahead of the curve as electrophysiologists. So that makes me happy. Everything I talk about from here forward puts the patient at the center of the universe. That's a patient there. That's the digital universe. And if you look, we can empower patients. And we talked about communicating patients when we're talking about um, whether or not to use a particular closure device. It's individualized. We use the data we have, but we really need to individualize it. So we can use social media. We can use home monitoring. We can use wearables to impact that patient digital space. They can get answers. They can include their family and friends. They can get a continuum of care through remote monitoring. They can find answers to questions. They can better understand their care. And that's where remote monitoring and wearables and all this data generating stuff that we have can play a role. So specifically, how does big data and AI make an impact? I believe that artificial intelligence through the use of AI or through the use of big data, can help us predict epidemics. We already do that now through the CDC. We can cure disease because we can find better ways and better treatments. We can improve quality of life, which if you're a heart failure patient and you're miserable and you're a class three, a class four, and you, you all of a sudden have someone who figured out, oh my gosh, the reason that your bi ICD isn't making you feel any better is because you're an AFib 50% of the time. And they make an intervention and fix that. And that quality of life is so much better. And it goes from lying in bed watching television to being able to go to the mailbox or go to the grocery store. That's huge. And then avoiding preventable deaths. I argue, and I think we all would agree, that prevention is far better than cure. And big data promotes prevention and prediction and also innovation. So when you define strictly what AI is, it's when we use computers to solve problems or make decisions that normally require human intelligence, human smarts. And there's really two approaches. The mathematicians and the, and the computer scientists are really good at this. Logic and rules-based approach or pattern recognition. What I'm gonna do is suggest to you that AI is not as complicated as you might think. Think of it as a Russian nesting doll, a matryoshka doll. This is an article I wrote in EP Perspectives is, I think, May of 2018. But when we unstack these dolls, the big fat doll on the outside is AI. Basically, it's the simulation of human intelligence using machines, using computer system. The next doll inside is machine learning. And people throw these terms around all the time, and they're actually misusing them. Machine learning uses algorithms to analyze data and it learns from the data. And they can, the machines then can make determinations, decisions, and predictions. Basically, machine learning is the ability to learn without being programmed to do something different. It's pattern recognition. It's learning about patterns. And that's what machine learning is. The coolest part is the tiny doll. 
which is deep learning. Deep learning has two concepts, deep artificial neural networks and deep reinforcement learning. A neural network <clears throat> is a set of algorithms that recognize patterns and then clusters and classifies data. So then, using artificial intelligence, after seeing a million EKGs, they can start to sort out, this is normal and this is not normal, because it's a pattern. When I learned to read EKGs at Duke, it was pattern recognition when you read all these EKGs over and over again. Reinforcement learning is when the Watson computer learned how to play chess. Reinforcement learning is when a computer understands patterns, it kind of classifies this data, it understands the algorithms, and then it says, there's a consequence to the decision that I make as a computer. I know it sounds kind of creepy, but it's real. So how do we translate this into real life? There's personalized medicine, there's a disease identification, there's disease management and remote monitoring, and I think that we can use it in therapy development and clinical trials as well. And the FDA is making a huge push. Scott Gottlieb in the uh, United States, our commissioner of the FDA, has made one of his biggest things is to create a way that companies and researchers and academics and clinicians can get AI approved in healthcare in a reasonable amount of time in a safe way that protects patients as well. But what we're gonna talk about today, because it's what I know the most about when you come to AI, is remote monitoring and connectedness. I believe that remote monitoring and connected patients improve outcomes, I can show you data, saves money, it does in the US, it improves compliance, and it engages the patient. And data that we gather from this patient who's connected to everything, not only impacts that patient's care, but it can help entire populations because that's the dichotomy. We have personalized data from me that could be de-identified, put in a huge database with 100,000 patients, and then we can use that data to help personalize care for another patient and then help entire populations that way. Monitoring, according to Eric Topol, is the, and I'm gonna quote him, is the essence of digitizing a human being. For medical purposes, getting every bit of the essential data and this will be information that radically transforms the future of medicine. We will sit in this room 20 years from now, God willing, some of us are still here. We'll sit in this room 20 years from now and AI will be helping us. Now, one thing I'll make clear and why it's important to be a doctor, and why it's important to be a human being, because we have empathy and we care for our patients and we have judgment. But a doctor who uses a really good stethoscope is a better doctor. A doctor who uses AI and what computer algorithms can do to help us is a better doctor, I believe. So what type of monitoring tech is out there? Well, we all know we can implant defibrillators and ICDs and loop recorders. There's dermally implanted sensors. There's wearables. There's smart tattoos. There's cardio mimps. We get this real-time data from these at-home devices. And, you know, robust research, you guys are all aware of this, really supports remote monitoring and what it can do for us. There's a biotronic study, uh, biotronic sponsored study. There's in time, there's trust, there's compass, there's e cost. All of these show different things, such as decreased hospitalizations. Some show decreased numbers of deaths, decreased strokes, saves money. Remote monitoring makes sense. The problem is, it's a ton of data. The Heart Rhythm Society believes so strongly that in 2015, I participated in this consensus statement that remote monitoring is standard of care. We should be doing it. We must be doing it. They even went a step further that says when you get informed consent from a patient prior to a pacemaker or ICD or loop recorder implant, you must inform them that remote monitoring is possible and you must discuss remote monitoring with them before you even implant the device. I have to admit, I didn't do that when I was a practicing EP because there's too much else going on. But this just shows you how important it is. And it's going to get more important to all of us and more useful because over the next three and a half years, we're going to have over 20 million connected patients worldwide. They're going to use some home monitoring service. But I believe that this data coming in is so vast, it's like trying to put out a house with a garden hose. Honestly, it's about the, the responsible and efficient use of this data. Live patient data streams are the future of healthcare. That's where we're gonna be. It's the biggest shift in digital health over the coming years will be to comprehensive home monitoring of one type or another. In the US, we have data rules just like you do. I know that in Europe, in the EU in particular, 
data privacy is huge. It is here as well in the US, but I think you guys take it to a new level, and I think that's good. First thing I do with my patients is I say, this data belongs to you. If anybody says that you can't have your data, they're stealing from you. It's your data. This is our poor device nurse or device tech working, you know, working all day long, and the data keeps coming. They just want to bang their head on the computer because they cannot process the data. At Cleveland Clinic, at Duke, at Stanford, some of the best institutions in the United States, everybody is struggling. They're behind. They're so behind in the paperwork to get this data processed. I'll tell you how we processed it at Duke. It's horrible. We had four different vendors to four different sites, four different computers. The nurses downloaded it. They printed it out. Then they put it on my desk in folders that said, better look at this right now, look at this sometime, and please look at this eventually. Once we got through all that, it got adjudicated by the nurse after I you know, wrote what to do. Then it gets scanned into the electronic medical record. Then I have to go back into the EHR and sign it again. What if in an emergency room, let's say it's 100 miles from the nearest major center, we have a point of care solution that we sit down in that ER, and every time a patient comes in that has a device, and as you guys know, people who don't know devices are scared of devices. In the US, because we're very litigious, if a patient comes in with a fractured humerus and they have a pacemaker, they'll treat the humerus, everything will be fixed, the patient will be ready to go home, but the guy will say, I can't let you go until somebody checks your pacemaker. Even though they've got a monitor, they've got an EKG, everything looks fine, they're scared to death of it. So then that patient sits in the hospital, and they sit there in the ER tying up that bed, tying up time. They want to go home and just forget the whole thing happened. And they're there for six hours because a rep has to drive an hour or two to the hospital, interrogate the device. By then, the doctors have changed shifts in the ER. So he's talked to a new guy, initiate a new plan, and then that guy ultimately goes home. What if you have a device sitting in the, in the hospital and we do an electronic handshake? So it's, a, it's home monitoring. As soon as that handshake happens, it goes to the cloud, to Biotronic or to Medtronic or whoever, and then comes down to CareLink or their own proprietary, but it comes down in parallel to Pacemate. When that download comes down, an SMS page goes to our technician on call and goes to the Medtronic, Biotronic or whoever rep on call to say, we just checked your device. Within 15 minutes, our tech is calling that ER saying, this is a normal pacemaker, there's nothing going on here, everything's fine, you can let the patient go. That doctor then is able to document that in the electronic health record. The um, biotronic rep gets a page or a call from us that says, this is what we did, so that biotronic rep doesn't walk in the next morning, and the doctor says, hey, thanks for checking that patient, and the bio guy's like, what? what I, I don't even know what you're talking So everybody's in the loop, and then that patient goes home. Think about the money you save. In the U.S., Every minute you're sitting in an ER bed costs money, and it also prevents that bed being used for another patient, and you've got people piling up on the outside. It also saves labor costs for industry because reps are expensive, they're highly talented, they're highly trained, and they help all of us in the EP lab. I could not have functioned without my rep for 17 years. Very, very highly trained. That rep, I need him in the lab the next morning, and he's been up all night because he's been running all over rural ERs all night. This eliminates that. And that's what I mean about connectedness and the use of these things. I will fight with anyone who says that AI is gonna replace physicians. It's never gonna replace us. It's gonna make us better. Digital tools will allow us to better influence and monitor our patients. Remote monitoring with wearables and loop recorders and other connected devices will also improve our ability to reduce strokes, improve success in the management of chronic disease, and identify those who need more treatment or more care or more lifestyle modification. The use of big data in medicine is going to help us predict disease and prevent disease. We are digitizing the human being as we speak. When we automate remote monitoring, it's important because it allows us to do what we do best, not do that stupid lengthy paperwork that I was talking about. We get to be doctors. We get to go take care of patients. We get to visit with patients on the wards as you're making rounds in the evening rather than signing charts. And the ideal system when you use big data and automation and AI combines doctors and robots together. And I think that keeping up with rapidly evolving technology is just as important for us as physicians as it is to keep up with the latest and greatest techniques like his bundle pacing. I think it's just important to understand what's out there and how it might be used. And then we go to those last two Vs. Is this valuable data and is it valid? And is it something that's gonna change? So this is another article I wrote. It's called Digitizing the Human Being. It's about a year old, um, and I commit it to you. It's in a little EP Lab Digest art, uh, 
journal. We're also, um, I was two weeks late submitting it as usual, but we're going to be published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology coming up probably in about a quarter. And we're, walk, we're talking about social media use for physicians, for cardiologists specifically, and how it can impact the care of heart failure. One of the things I've done for two years is I realized that all this paperwork and all this stuff that we have to do as physicians is overwhelming. And you get burned out and you get so tired of it. And all you want to do is be a doctor. You just want to care for patients. You want to talk to patients. You want to learn something about their family. In my practice, I went from having 35 minutes a patient to having six because no longer were we in charge of our own lives. The government, the administrators, the middlemen were telling me how to practice medicine. So I walked away. And I spent months sailing around the South Pacific Islands. And I went to the island of Fiji, which is 300 outlying islands, and I organized a medical team. We called ourselves the Floating Healthcare Clinic. And we saw 347, I did, patients in three weeks. Every single patient I saw, I used the Alive Core. And I have a database, and I'm going to try to publish it, a database of the incidence of AF in an isolated South uh, Pacific population. One island, 350 patients on the island of Batiki, all have. These things, I had a satellite on the boat. I would upload this, goes up to Dr. Dave in San Francisco. Their AI algorithms are, down, are, are collecting all this data and processing it. I mean, I don't need AI to tell me this is AFib or not AFib, but it's still the, the, the interesting part is I'm in the third world and I'm using first world technologies. So thank you so much. Other burning questions to Kevin? There's one question. Would you be willing to join an effort uh, together with physicians at HRS to work on the standards uh, being used for the transmission of all this data from all the devices? Because we are working on this for many years and it's a difficult thing, as you can imagine. I would be honored to be a part of that because I think it's vital because what we like to talk about in the U.S. is open access to data. I am tired of Johnson & Johnson doing a study and keeping their data away from Pfizer. I want to share data shared in a collective way that we all do better. We make better decisions, we make better drugs, we make better therapies. But I think I would very much like to help with that yep. position statement because I think it's gonna be vital to help Europeans, citizens, and doctors, and legislators understand that this data is secure, that this data is being used for the good and yep. not for bad. And that is one of the big reasons I'm so happy to be here in front of European experts is because I want to impress upon you how much we need this data to be used for research purposes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for staying Thank in the you. room and see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>